Buenos días, hermanos y hermanas. Welcome to Hunker Down Worship this morning as we gather today uh, on this Sunday in April. Um, we are in a different space today. We are actually over at Beth's uh, daughter Quinn's house and Quinn and Brantley's house, Quinn and Brantley and Claire's house. Uh, and so uh, we're coming to you from a little bit of a different spot today than we normally do, but uh, queremos dar una bienvenida a todos los que se congregan con nosotros para celebrar el Día del Señor uh, uh, en este domingo. Um, a couple of quick things. First of all, huge shout out to everybody who helped with the vaccine clinic last Sunday. Tons of volunteers from our congregation, from House of Neighborly Service, from uh, other communities, uh, other congregations, faith communities. Uh, we had a Hindu community that came out to help us and a Baptist community that came out to help us. We managed to get 347 one-dose vaccines into different people's arms. And I just feel like, uh, I feel so proud, so proud of our church for stepping up and pulling that off uh, in such a short, short time frame. So, bendiciones y gratitud inmensa a todos los que ayudaron uh, con esa clínica la semana pasada. Um, want to let you all know that uh, Beth and I are actually gonna take some vacation time uh, You're be, shocked, I know. I know. Uh, we haven't taken any really this whole year. And so uh, we're going to take some vacation time beginning the Monday after next Sunday. So that's the 26th. Sixth. 26th. And uh, we'll be back in the saddle on the 10th of May. Um, we will still do worship. So we'll still have worship. Um, we're going to try to get it done ahead of time um, so we don't have to take everything that we need to record with us on the road. But, uh, but we won't be around. We won't be in the office. I won't be in the office. Beth won't be in her office. Uh, we will, Don't call us. Yeah, we won't answer. Don't call. We're going to be uh, off, off the grid for a little while. So um, un poco de vacación. Y cuando volvemos, when we come back, we will be, God willing, and nothing crazy happens, we will be worshiping in our sanctuary for the first time together since last March. So uh, May 16th is our target day to come back into the sanctuary. So please set that on your calendar and um, be sure to be ready to join us on the 16th. Um, let's see. I think that that's uh, all the announcements that I have for this morning. Creo que es todo los anuncios. So why don't we light our Christ candle and begin our time of worship together. We remember that Jesus said, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me, whoever follows me, will not walk in darkness, will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. But will have the light of life. Sisters and brothers in Christ, amando, Serviendo, compartiendo y creciendo en Jesucristo. Vamos a adorar a nuestro Dios. So let us begin our time of worship together uh, with the song that David Rivera is going to lead us in, Piedad, O oh Santo Dios, Piedad. Dave?
Thank you, David, for that beautiful rendition of that song. Um, when we come to worship, cuando venimos a adorar a Dios, venimos a entregar nuestra persona entera. To worship is to give our whole selves to God, to place our whole selves at God's disposition, to turn our entire self over to the will of God. And we begin that process by emptying our own hearts, by turning over the things that we carry that occupy our mind and our energy and our concern. So let us turn to God in prayer and offer the prayers of our hearts. Oyenos, mi Dios. Oyenos, mi Dios. Oyenos, mi Dios. Escucha la gente. Señor, venimos hoy deseando entregar nuestras vidas a tu persona, a tu reino, al proyecto de vida que tú tienes en el mundo. We bring to you, God, then, the things that, that burden us, the things that, that weigh us down this day, and the things for which we are grateful and for which we thank you. Lord, we are so thankful for the successful vaccine clinic this past Sunday and for all of the 347 people who were able to get vaccinated, for the chance to engage our community to tell people that we love them in the name of Jesus Christ through that action. We thank you for a number of folks who have uh, helped out not only with the vaccine clinic as volunteers, but volunteers who are helping to redo the time garden, uh, I mean the time dollar prayer garden in the back of time dollar and to work on their landscaping. I just thank you for the volunteers in the life of our community uh, who have been helping in all these different ways. <clears throat> Lord, we lift up special prayers for the Rivera family as they continue moving through their grief and loss at Hiram's death. And thank you for the chance to gather together and celebrate his life on Tuesday and Wednesday. We lift up to you two members. Uh, our brand new member, Sammy Hernandez, who was baptized on Easter, is going in for surgery tomorrow. And Mary Suttles is also going in for surgery this week. And so we ask you, God, to be with them and to be the healer that they need. We thank you for the doctors and medical staff who will be your hands and your agents of healing in their lives. We lift up to you, O oh God, all of the families that have been victimized by gun violence over these last weeks, and we pray that you will comfort them, but that you will also give us the will as a nation to find ways to restrain the gun violence that occurs so frequently in our nation. We lift up to you, God, a prayer of gratitude and a prayer of protection for all of the workers who this week begin the asbestos abatement in our building and begin the reconstruction process. And hopefully six months from now, we will have a brand new building to be able to inhabit and utilize. We pray for them. We continue our prayers for Jim Mueller, who is in rehab, we pray continually, Lord, for the children and for all of the border officials and health and human services officials who are addressing the crisis, the, human, the humanitarian crisis of children arriving at our borders, seeking safety, seeking security, seeking hope. And now, O oh Lord, each of us offers to you the prayers of our own heart prayers that we carry within us. And God, the prayers that we don't know how to pray, we lift up to you in the words that Jesus has shared with us, words that knit us together as one family of faith. For you are our Father, who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. 
thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Oyenos, mi Dios. Oyenos, mi Dios, Amen. All of us have experienced a time when some mistake we have made has paralyzed us in shame or guilt or regret. All of us have experienced moments when the big blunder of our lives just trips us up so hard that we have trouble getting back on our feet again. And yet, and yet, God continues to pursue us with forgiveness and mercy, desiring to give us a chance to start anew. Until we understand that that forgiveness is always there, we will unfortunately allow ourselves to wallow in a place where we can't forgive ourselves or others. So let us make a practice, not just on Sunday morning, but as a way of life, of turning to God when we have made mistakes and admitting the truth so that we can be washed and start anew. Let us turn to God, a spirit of confession. We We often often have have a hard hard time time with forgiveness, forgiveness, Lord. Learning to forgive should should be one one of the central practices practices of our faith as we follow in in the way of Jesus. Jesus. But the The truth truth is, We We struggle struggle to forgive. forgive. We We often often can't can't forgive ourselves for errors made in the past. And And so we we live tortured and shackled by our guilt and shame. We We often choose to nurse a grudge instead of offering forgiveness to someone who hurt us. And so we embitter our lives. We haven't understood that forgiveness is the key to peace. Forgive Forgive us and and help help us to use the tools you have given to us, Lord. Hear our silent prayers. Let us each add our own confession in silence. Amen. So here's the great good news. If we say there's no sin in us, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. But if we confess our sin, God is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Sisters and brothers, hermanos y hermanas, yo les declaro con toda confianza que en Cristo Jesús somos un pueblo perdonado. Gloria a Dios. Alleluia. Amen. <clears throat> Would you join me in prayer as we prepare to hear the Holy Scriptures this morning? Let us pray. Querido y amoroso Dios, gracias por traer cada uno aquí a este momento para poder escuchar de tu palabra sabiduría que puede transformar nuestras vidas. Y liberarnos de todo lo que nos tiene atado y encadenado. God, we pray that as your word is read and as your word is proclaimed, that we may hear what we need to hear to be set free 
that we may live in the freedom of the children of God, the freedom for which we were created, the freedom for which Christ gave his life. For it is in his name we pray. Amen. So this being the second Sunday after Easter, I'm going to read one of the uh, gospel accounts of the appearance of Jesus to the disciples after his resurrection. And each of the gospels has a very different take on what happened after the resurrection. Each of the gospels has a different perspective on what uh, happened, on how and where Jesus uh, visited the disciples. So for example, in Mark's gospel, at the end of the resurrection, the women run out of the, of the empty tomb, scared to death and afraid to say anything to anyone about what they've seen. At the end of Matthew's gospel, the disciples are still in Galilee, uh, excuse me, are back in Galilee upon a mountain. Uh, there's not a lot of big mountains in Galilee, but upon a hill and there upon the hill, Jesus gives them the great commission to go and make disciples of all nations, teaching them to do all I have commanded you, and lo, I will be with you always till the close of the age. In Luke's gospel, we find Jesus not returning to Galilee with the disciples at all, but staying in the vicinity of Jerusalem in Bethany. And there at Bethany, he ascends to heaven, having given them his final instructions. John's gospel, which is the gospel we'll be reading today, John's gospel shares a couple of different stories of Jesus coming to the disciples when they're hiding, scared in a locked room, and he speaks to them peace. But Thomas is not present and doubts what the other disciples have said, and so Thomas gets a special visitation a few days later where Jesus allows him to place his hands in his wounds and know that it is indeed the Lord who has risen. And then comes this account. After the disciples have journeyed all the way back to Galilee, a long walk because there's not any other way to get there except walking. And by the time they get to Galilee, the disciples are unsure of what comes next. And it is there, as they decide to go fishing, that Jesus meets them again. Listen to this reading as we read from John chapter 21, verses 1 through 19. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee, it happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, which would be James and John, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter declared to them. And they said, we'll go with you. So they went out, got in the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood upon the shore, but the disciples did not realize who it was. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. Then he said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. And when they did, they were unable to haul in the net because there were so many fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. And as soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him for he had taken it off and he jumped into the water. I think I would have done that the other way. <laughs> the other disciples followed him in the boat, towing the net full of fish for they were not far from the shore, only about a hundred yards out. And when they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals and there were fish on it and some bread. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have just caught. 
And Simon Peter climbed aboard and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153 fish. But even with so many, the net had not broken. And Jesus said to them, come and have some breakfast. But none of the disciples dared ask, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. Now this was the third time he had appeared to his disciples after he raised, was raised from the dead. And after they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? And he answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. And a third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Then Jesus said, feed my sheep. I tell you the truth. When you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you were old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. And then he said to him, follow me. Y ahora en español. Después de esto, Jesús se apareció de nuevo a sus discípulos junto al lago de Galilea. Sucedió de esta manera. Estaban juntos Simón Pedro, Tomás, al que apodaban el gemelo, Natanael, el de Caná de Galilea, los hijos de Zebedeo, Santiago y Juan, y otros dos discípulos. Yo me voy a pescar, declaró Simón Pedro. Nos vamos contigo, contestaron ellos. Salieron pues de allí y se embarcaron, para esa, pero, pero esa noche no pescaron nada. Al despuntar el alba, Jesús se hizo presente en la orilla, pero los discípulos no se dieron cuenta de que era él. Muchachos, amigos, ¿no tienen algo de comer? Les preguntó Jesús. No, respondieron ellos. Tiran su red a la derecha de la barca y pescarán algo. Así lo hicieron. Y era tal la cantidad de pescados que ya no podían sacar la red. Es el Señor, dijo, Pe dijo a Pedro el discípulo a quien Jesús amaba. Tan pronto como Simón Pedro le oyó decir, es el Señor, se puso la ropa, pues estaba semidesnudo, y se tiró al agua. Los otros discípulos lo siguieron en la barca, arrastrando la red llena de pescados, pues estaban a, escaso, a escasos cien metros de la orilla. Al desembarcar, vieron unas brasas con un pescado encima y un pan. Traigan alguno de los pescados que acaban de sacar, les dijo Jesús. Y Simón Pedro subió a bordo y arrastró hasta la orilla la red, la cual estaba llena de pescados de buen tamaño. Eran 153, pero a pesar de ser tantos, la red no se rompió. Vengan a desayunar, les dijo Jesús. Ninguno de los discípulos se atrevía a preguntarle, ¿Quién eres tú? Porque todos sabían que era el Señor. Jesús se acercó, tomó el pan y se lo dio a ellos, e hizo lo mismo con el pescado. Esta fue la tercera vez que Jesús se apareció a sus discípulos después de haber resucitado. Y cuando terminaron de desayunar, Jesús le preguntó a Simón Pedro, Simón, hijo de Juan, ¿me amas más que estos? Sí, Señor, tú sabes que te quiero, contestó Pedro. Apacienta mis corderos, le dijo Jesús. 
Y volvió a preguntarle, Simón, hijo de Juan, ¿me amas? Sí, Señor, tú sabes que te quiero. Cuida mis ovejas. Por tercera vez, Jesús le preguntó, Simón, hijo de Juan, ¿me quieres? A Pedro le dolió que por tercera vez le hubiera preguntado, ¿me quieres? Así que le dijo, Señor, tú lo sabes todo y tú sabes que te quiero. Apacienta mis ovejas, le dijo Jesús. De veras te aseguro que cuando eras más joven te vestías tú mismo e ibas donde querías, pero cuando seas viejo extenderás las manos y otro te vestirá y te llevará a donde no quieres ir. Esto dijo Jesús para dar a entender la clase de muerte con que Pedro glorificará, glorificaría a Dios. Después de eso, añadió Jesús, sígame. Hermanos y hermanas, esta es la palabra de Dios. Te alabamos, Señor. So if each of the Gospels, si cada uno de los Evangelios tiene una, un juego de cuentos diferentes para concluir su Evangelio después de la resurrección, es porque cada uno de ellos tuvo algún punto para aclarar, algún, algún mensaje para comunicar a través de las historias que decidieron incluir en su Evangelio. So if each of these gospel writers did something a little different, they must have done it for a reason. They must have done it for some purpose, not just because. And if I think about John's gospel, and I think about why he would take the disciples all the way back to Galilee and experience this encounter with Jesus on the beach, where they first encountered him many, many months before, and where Jesus would engage Peter in a very peculiar but healing ritual. I think it's because John wants to leave us with the message that we can always begin again with God. We can always begin again with God. I love that the disciples are just hanging out on the beach in this particular text. I love that, uh, that it's almost like they're killing time. They've, they've been through this enormous experience of ministry with Jesus and then the, the horrific experiences of, of Jesus being arrested and taken away from them and, and in Peter's case, having, having tried to follow Jesus but then being accused of being one of his disciples and in fear denying that he belonged to him and then watching him crucified and then experiencing the, the, the astonishment of the resurrection and then having the risen Christ come in their presence two previous times. And then they walk back to Galilee. It's at least a couple days journey. And there in Galilee, back where most of them hailed from, they're hanging out, hanging out by the shore, hanging out by the lake, twiddling their thumbs, wondering what to do. You know, it's not like Jesus gave them an operations manual for how to start the church. <laughs> it's not like Jesus gave them clear instructions. He gave them an experience of ministry with him. But what were they supposed to do with it now? There was no guidebook. There was no how-to. And so they fumbled. They fumbled in uncertainty. And Peter, what does he want to do? Let's go fishing. I know how to do that. I may not know how to do anything else, but I do know how to fish. 
Well, at least he thought he did. <laughs> For they fished all night and they came home empty-handed. Nothing in the boat. Nothing at all. And then they see Jesus upon the shore. They're not sure that it's him. But then John, the writer of the gospel, the disciple who Jesus loved, says to Peter, it's the Lord. And Peter instantly knows that he's right and jumps out of the boat and runs to greet him. Now, I don't know about you, but there have been times in my life when I have been through a what could easily be considered a, a life-changing experience, an experience, uh, an exposure to something that I never knew I would have the opportunity to see or to, or to experience. And, and I come home from that and, and I don't know. I know that it's affected me, but I don't know what I'm supposed to do with it. I don't know how I am supposed to embody it. Uh, I think for a lot of folks, I think para mucho de nosotros, cuando tenemos una experiencia muy fuerte, una experiencia muy profunda, sabemos que tiene un impacto, que tuvo un impacto, pero a veces luchamos para discernir y descubrir cómo vamos a poner en, en marcha alguna respuesta, algún cambio en nuestra vida a base de lo que hemos vivido. I think, I think the disciples were probably in that kind of place. The uncertainty of what do we do with this? This was incredible. This was an unimaginable experience. It has moved us beyond anything we ever would have experienced had we stayed here in Galilee. But in the end, that's where they find themselves again, back in Galilee by the shore of the sea where Jesus first met many of them and invited them to follow him. I don't think it's an accident that John brings them all the way back to the beginning. Because at least one of those disciples, Peter, is paralyzed. Paralyzed by his failure. Paralyzed by his denial of the one whom he loved. Peter's three refusals to admit that he was one of Jesus' disciples there in the courts of the Sanhedrin. And then the crowing of the cock, which Jesus predicted would happen, broke him broke his pride, his assurance, his clarity, his passion, his power. And Peter found himself unsure of himself, unsure of his commitment, unsure of his next steps. And I think that is exactly why John brings the story back to the beginning brings the story back to the place where they started. You know, a lot of us have experiences in life that we're not proud of. Um, our son Bobby was interviewing me just this week and he uh, asked a number of just different questions about my personal life and experience. And one of the questions that he asked me and the other people he was interviewing was, if you could get one do-over again, what would it be? Many of us have something that we really wish we could have done differently and would have done differently had we gone back, had we been given the opportunity to go back. Muchos tenemos ese deseo de, de vivir diferente algún evento en nuestra vida, o alguna decisión, alguna acción que cometimos. Peter clearly lived with that wish that he had been able to man up, that he had been able to, to be bold enough to claim his allegiance to Jesus, but he hadn't. And the burden and the guilt and the shame of that failure, he carried deeply within him. And sometimes when we carry that kind of guilt and that kind of burden, 
in our lives and can't find the way clear to forgive ourselves, it can paint the rest of our lives with a dark tint. It can paint the rest of our, our sense of ourself with this, this brush of failure. A few years ago, when Beth and I were working at John Knox Ranch, one of the counselors who we came to really enjoy and appreciate right at the very end of camp did something that was a huge mistake, a mistake that ended up meaning he would not be able to come back to the camp again. And it broke him. He had been one of the most amazing counselors with the kids, getting in there, fully committed, always always uh, helping, always looking for the next thing that needed to be done. But he made one bad slip at the very end of camp. And it crushed him. And it, and it painted the entire summer experience negatively for him. And it crushed his sense of capacity as one who could work in that kind of setting ever again. And I remember calling him aside and saying, hey, don't let this one failure ruin your sense of who you are because you are an amazing human being with tremendous gifts and capacities. And there are other places where you can use them besides this place. You are good. And this mistake does not, is not the sum total of who you are. And yet so often when we make big blunders, we allow that one mistake to paint our entire sense of who we are with such negativity that we can't rise above it again. I get the sense that that is what happened for Peter. That all of the amazing things that he did and said and participated in with Jesus in their entire span of their ministry together were completely wiped out by the one failure to claim his identity as a disciple in the Sanhedrin court. Y porque no pudo superar ni perdonarse por lo que sucedió, no pudo imaginar la posibilidad de trabajar por Dios en el futuro. Era un fracaso en su propia mente. But that, that is where the grace comes in in this story. The grace that reminds us that God will not let us go. God will pursue us until we can experience a love and a forgiveness that is bigger than our guilt and our shame and our regret. Jesus shows up on the beach and this carpenter teaches these fishermen how to fish again and they pull in 153, why 153 fish? We don't know. Nobody seems to know. There have been all kinds of conjectures and comments about why there was 153 fish, but the truth is nobody really knows why. Jesus extends to them the grace of one more meal, reminiscent of the meals that they shared when thousands were fed with bread and fish. And Jesus enjoys one more breakfast with these disciples around the shores of Galilee. But the real work, the real reason that he came back to where it all began was to help Peter recover a sense of his capacity as a shepherd to the flock that Jesus was now entrusting to him and to the others. He calls Peter aside. Y le pregunta a Peter, Pedro, me amas, me amas aún más que estos. Do you love me more than these? And Jesus is using in the Greek of the text the word agape for love. The Greeks had three different words for love, agape, phileo, and eros. 
Agape is the self-sacrificial love, the love that is willing to lay down its life. Jesus asked Peter, do you love me with that kind of love? And Peter cannot say yes to that. But he can say, Lord, I love you, phileo. I love you as a brother. But I can't claim that I would lay down my life because I failed to do it. I was afraid for my life, and so I denied you. Jesus says to him again, Peter, do you love me? Me amas, Pedro. And he says, Lord, you know that I love you as a brother. And one final time, Jesus says to him, Peter, do you love me as a brother? And Peter says, yes, Lord, I love you as a brother. In that very conversation, Jesus tries to help Peter acknowledge that he does have the capacity to live that sacrificial love He tries to help him pull that out of himself, but Peter can't. And so Jesus goes just a little further and says, then love me as you are able, and that will be enough. Love me as you can, and that will be sufficient. And at the end of each of Peter's answers, cada vez que Pedro contesta que si lo ama, Jesus says, then feed my sheep, take care of my lambs, shepherd my flock. This is now your task. You must step into this role and you cannot do it as long as you are bound by your guilt and your regret and your shame. You've got to understand that I love you and I forgive you and that you have a chance to start again right here on these shores where we started it all in the first place, you can start again. And that, friends, that is why John tells the stories he tells at the end of his gospel. To remind us that God's grace pursues us and will not let us go, will relentlessly extend love for us until we finally are able to receive it. And that message, that message is one that I share with uh, our granddaughter on a regular basis in this little book, (laughs) The Runaway Bunny. Uh, Many of you may know this book, but the story is about a bunny who is trying to run away from his mother for whatever reason. And he says that he's going to run away and he's going to run into stream where he would be a fish and swim away from his mom. And the mom says, well, if you become a fish, I will become a fisherman and I will catch you so that I can have you back with me again. And he says, well, if you try to catch me, then I will climb a mountain to get away from you. And she says, well, then I will become a mountain climber and I will climb to wherever you are so that you know that I love you. And he says, well, if you climb a mountain to get me, then I will become a flower in a garden and hide myself among the other flowers. And she says, well, then I will become a gardener and I will come and find you and I will bring you home with me. And then he says, if you're a gardener and find me, then I will grow wings out of my ears will become wings and I will fly away into the trees high, high up where you cannot reach me. And the mother says, well, then I will become the tree that you land in so that you will know that I still love you. And he says, then I will become a boat and my ears will become sails and I will sail far, far away. The mother says, well, then I will become the wind and blow you back home. And he says, well, I will become a trapeze artist and I will swing on the high trapeze and so high up that you could never reach me. And the mother says, then I will learn to walk the tightrope so that I can walk over to you and be with you still. And then the bunny says, then I will become a little boy and I will run all the way into a house and hide from you. And she will say, then I will be your mother and I will be in that house to put you on my lap and tell you a story and remind you that you are loved. 
You see, the runaway bunny couldn't run away from the love of mom. And we can't run away from God's love. Peter couldn't. Not even all the way back to Galilee, not even out on a fishing boat in the middle of the sea. God relentlessly will pursue us with love until finally we turn around and accept the forgiveness and the mercy and the love that has always been there. That, that is the power of God's love for you and for me. Let us pray. Querido, querido y amoroso Dios, por un amor que siempre nos persigue, que no nos dejará, que siempre buscará la manera y la forma en alcanzarnos para que pudiéramos entender finalmente que somos amados, que somos perdonados, que somos hijos e hijas queridos y queridas. Ayúdanos, Señor, a no permitir en nuestra vida que las equivocaciones del pasado nos atan y nos encadenan al pasado, sino ayúdanos a descubrir la libertad que viene por el perdón y por el amor que nos persigue. Por Cristo te lo pedimos. Amén. God is in the business of taking broken things and turning them into something incredibly wonderful and useful, beneficial to the reign of God, to the realm of God, to the purposes of God. And that is a reason to be grateful, that our brokenness will never be enough to keep God from being able to use us. Grateful for that, Grateful for all that God has done in our lives, all that God has given to us in our lives. Let us return thanks with the gift of our tithes and our offerings. Thank you for your generous support of this congregation's life and work. You enable us to continue to be a light in our neighborhood, a light for our neighbors, a source of support and strength and encouragement to people who are broken and who are hurting. Thank you for your support. And as you give, whether that's online or with a check or in an envelope that you drop off at the church later on this week, please enjoy the song, Beautiful Things. Today, it will be played not by us, but by my lovely wife and her amazing band from Shepherd of the Hills. Beautiful Things.
our time has come to an end. Thank you so much. Gracias, gracias a todos que han venido a participar con nosotros durante este servicio este domingo. Queremos concluir con una oración. So let us close our time together with a word of prayer. God, for the immensity of your love, which pursues us, even though we may try to be runaway bunnies from time to time, you pull us back in, you draw us back to yourself, and you remind us that your love is greater than anything we could ever do, and that there is nothing in all the height and depth of all creation that can separate us from the love we have known in Jesus Christ. Gracias, Señor, por este mensaje confirmado hoy en la historia de Pedro y su restauración por Jesús. <clears throat> Bendícenos ahora que entramos a esta semana para que seamos signos de vida en el mundo hoy. Esto te pedimos en el nombre de Cristo Jesús. Amén. <clears throat> Go then, friends. May the grace of Jesus and the love of God and the fellowship of their Holy Spirit be over you, upon you, within you, and through you for the world, today, tomorrow, and always. Amen. Amen. Let's sing together, Dios el amor que me persigue. Dios el amor que me persigue, Dios el sonido en mi voz, Dios el poder que me sostiene, Cristo envuélveme, Cristo envuélveme. Dios por detrás y a Dios ilumina mi andar Sobre mí siempre Dios vigila Sí, Cristo envuélveme Cristo 